I'm going to read verses 23 down to verse 29, larger text than we've covered the last several weeks, and so I want you to follow with me as I read our text. Paul says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, notice that hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. There's our theme. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Wherefore, I am made a minister, again, verse 25, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word. Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest unto the saints. To whom God would make known, verse 27, what is the riches of His glory, of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, referring to Christ, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. I heard that there's an individual, a Pentagon official, that has a sign on their desk in the Pentagon that reads, the secrecy of my job does not permit me to know what I'm doing. (laughs) You know, with all the stuff going on in the government lately, that's not hard to believe. But I laughed when I heard that, and I thought that a lot of ministers could have a similar sign on their desk that would read, the sacredness of my job does not permit me to know what I'm doing. You know, there's a lot of ministers that don't know what a minister is supposed to be and what a minister is supposed to do. Now, my easy response to that, what is a minister to be and to do, is the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. I believe this is the owner's manual. God has given to the church His Word. And whatever the Bible says a pastor is to be, whatever the Bible says a minister is to do, that's what he's to be and that's what he's to do. But we are all called to be ministers. Now, I don't know if you noticed it, but twice in verse 23, he says, I, Paul, am made a minister. And then again in verse 25, wherefore, I am made a minister. And Paul knew what God had called him to be, God, Paul knew what God had called him to do, and that is to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be a faithful steward over that which God had entrusted to him. Now, I want to look at this passage and draw from it four marks of true ministry. we got a lot of text to cover this morning, so I want you to stay with me. But if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you four marks of true ministry. Ministry, And they are not only true of me as a pastor, so-called minister, but they are true of you because I believe every member of this church is to be a minister. Now, before we break this down, these four points, I want to mention that the word minister, by the way, is the word servant. That is the word servant. The idea that the minister is above the church is not biblical. The minister is beneath the church. He is to be serving the church. And how does he serve the church? By giving them God's Word. By building them up. By warning them. By admonishing them. By instructing them. By praying for them. By being an example for them. The minister is to build them up in Christ. And then I want to also point out, before I give you my four marks of true ministry, that in the context at this point in Colossians, that Paul continues the theme of the preeminence of Christ. Christ is to have preeminence in our ministries. And that all four of these characteristics of a true minister actually have Christ at the center. We are to have a Christ-centered ministry. Christ-centered church. It's all about Jesus Christ. He is to have the preeminence. Now let's look at these four qualities of true ministry. And that is quality number one, verse 23, is that he shares the gospel of Christ. A true minister shares the gospel of Christ. Go to verse 23 and look at it with me. 
Paul says, be not moved away from the hope of the Gospel. There's our point. Which you have heard, which was preached which to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I am made a minister for the purpose of preaching the hope of the Gospel. Now the word Gospel literally means good news. And I I know you're aware of that, but I want to make it clear that that word means good news. And I point this out, not good views, but good news. Not good opinions, not good ideas, not good philosophy, but good news. It's based upon the historical truth of the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension and exaltation of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would never perish but have what? Everlasting life. Is that good news? That's good news. And that's the good news that we are to preach and we are to publish. Paul talked about the good news in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One of the greatest kind of in a capsule description of the Gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And He was buried. Why does He say that? So we know He really died. And He rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. So it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You take out any of those elements and you don't have a Gospel. And the Gospel is because we're sinners. That's bad news. So the good news is even though we've sinned and the wages of sin is death and the soul that sins shall surely die, the good news is is that God has given us a free gift of salvation in the person of Jesus Christ and through the finished work of the cross. But I want you to notice that this good news was heard, verse 23, and preached, verse 23. I believe there is no substitute for the preaching of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and do what? Preach the Gospel. He didn't say go all the world and feed people. Should we feed people? Yeah, that's a great thing to do. There's times that you can't share the Gospel with somebody until you feed their their hunger. Should we clothe people? Yes, we should clothe people. Should we take shut-ins in and visit the hospitals and the sick and the needy? Shall we educate people? Yeah. All of the social involvement the church does is good, but it's not the priority of the church. The number one and most important thing that we do as a church is preach the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And we should never be deterred or distracted from that priority. And a lot of churches today, that's the last thing they do. They're not preaching the Gospel. They're not preaching the need for the Gospel that man is a sinner. And that God sent a Savior. And the only way to be saved is through faith and repentance and trusting Jesus and being born again as Jesus told Nicodemus. That's the Gospel. But we've turned into a social club instead of a preaching machine. And I believe that we need to get back to the purpose of what we exist for as ministers, as the church, preaching the Gospel. In Romans chapter 10, verse 15, it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the Gospel. Did you know you have beautiful feet? I think it'd be cool to have a barefoot Sunday sometime. Wouldn't that be cool? We'd have to open the doors and get the fans going and stuff like that. Welcome to revival. <laughs> but but just to remind us, wouldn't it be cool? Everybody came barefoot one Sunday just to remind that we have beautiful feet. And that our feet are to be used to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I think that that's what we need to do. We need to all go everywhere sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Which is my next point in verse 23, that the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. Notice in verse 23 it says, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Now why would Paul use words like that? Well, first of all, he's probably speaking in hyperbole. Because not every single native person in the entire world had heard the Gospel, but the entire Roman world had been reached with the Gospel, or everyone that Paul could reach was reached. But what he's trying to convey, I think, in that phrase, is trying to convey the idea that the Gospel is universal. 
and that it is not exclusive. Why? Because the false teachers who had come into the church in Colossae, and let us not forget that the reason Paul penned these words, the entire epistle, is because the Christians in Colossae had been invaded by false teachers. And what were the false teachers telling them? Jesus isn't enough. You need something more from Jesus, and that more than Jesus is only for, listen to me carefully, only for a select few. Only for an elite group chosen to gain the knowledge, the gnosis, the knowledge that we will introduce you to. So they were preaching an exclusive gospel, which was not a gospel. Any gospel that excludes races or ethnic groups or nationalities, any gospel that excludes anyone is not the the gospel. It's not the good news of Jesus Christ. The true gospel is inclusive. And I love that fact. And I think our church should reflect that, and it does. But we ought to pray that it does more so. Every race should be represented in this church. And I don't think there should be black churches and white churches or brown. I think we should be all churches should be all different colors. Amen? Because we're the body of Christ. And it's certainly going to happen when we get to heaven. When we're going to get to heaven, we're all going to be together forever. So learn to get along, okay? (laughs) We don't go to that country because we don't like those people. We don't preach the gospel to those people because we don't. No, the gospel is universal. It's for everyone. And the cool thing about the gospel is that it doesn't change. It's not for the intellectual elite. It's not for the upper classes. Not just for white folks or black folks or brown folks. It's for everyone. It doesn't matter. The Bible says all have sinned. All have fallen short. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It's inclusive. It's the whole church's job to take the whole gospel to the whole world. And let me tell you simply how we can do that, and that's just every person start telling somebody about Jesus. You know, if every Christian just in this church, if everyone that comes to Revival Christian Fellowship this week told one person about Jesus Christ, think of how the gospel would spread in this community. If we just got our mouths open, we just started telling others about Jesus. I love what Vance Havner said. He said, the gospel is not a secret to be hoarded, but a story to be heralded. Too many Christians are stuffing themselves with gospel blessing while millions have never had a taste. I think about we come to church and we sing our songs and we hear the sermon and we're so blessed and we so love the fellowship, but there are people that are dying in sin outside this church right now. Whenever I come to church on Sunday, I see people jogging by or taking a walk I'm thinking, man, I wish they'd come to revival. I wish they'd hear the gospel. Or I wish they were on their way to our church. Or these people need to hear. They may never come to this church, so the church needs to go to them. Amen? We need to go to our neighbors and go to our coworkers and go to our family members and tell them about Jesus Christ. Now, you may not be a public speaker, but you can certainly tell them, I was blind and now I see. I was lost and now I'm found. I was in bondage and now I've been set free. And Jesus Christ is the one that has changed my life. So the mark of a true minister is the preaching the gospel. Let me give you the second mark. And that is he suffers or she suffers for the cause of Christ. A true minister suffers willingly for the cause of Christ. And look at verse 24. Who now rejoice in my what? Sufferings. For who? For you. Why? That it may fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church. Paul preached Christ, so Paul suffered for Christ. Now let me be honest with you. If you get aggressive and you start telling people about Jesus, some people won't like it. Some people may subtly just ostracize you or they may openly attack you, but they're not going to like that. God will prepare hearts and some people will respond, but there'll be some people that say, don't tell me about Jesus. I don't want to hear that. And they'll get hostile. But that, that, that's not our responsibility. Ours is to just be faithful to tell them about Jesus. But I want you to notice that Paul says, in my suffering, I do what? I rejoice. You know, it's a joy and a privilege and a blessing to suffer for the cause of Christ. You know that Paul was writing these very words when he was in prison? This is one of his prison epistles. And while in prison, Paul 
was rejoicing. Now, how could Paul rejoice in his suffering? Let me give you two reasons. Number one, he was suffering for the church. For you, verse 24. He was suffering for the church. Jesus gave his life to create the church, his body, and we should love, serve, and be willing to suffer for the church. Let me ask you a question this morning. How much prayer and sacrifice and devotion and time and concern do you give for the church? You go, I, I, I don't really think about that. I just come on Sunday morning and hope your sermons aren't too boring. <laughs> and if they're really good, maybe I'll put some money in the offering next week or something like that. I mean, what commitment? What sacrifice? What price do you pay to make this a better church, a healthier church? The church universal, not just our local church. You know, if you really love God, you're going to love God's people. Not just this church, but all churches. I, I, I pray constantly for all the churches in this valley that we preach the Word. That we preach the Gospel. That we reach the lost. That we don't miss our calling as a church. And what do you do? Do you sacrifice? Do you pray? Do you give yourself and your time and your talents Dwight Timothy wrote this poem. It's a poem I saw many years ago. It says, I love thy church, O God, her walls before thee stand, dear as the apple of thine eye engraven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall, for her my prayers ascend. To her my cares and toils be given till toils and cares shall end. You know, we need to love the church as the body of Christ. We need to sacrifice, we need to pray, we need to give, we need to serve, we need to do all we can to enlarge its borders and to advance its cause. But not only was he suffering for the church, which caused him to rejoice, but secondly, he was suffering for Christ, which caused him to rejoice. I want you to notice that in verse 24, Paul says, to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. To fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, what does Paul mean by filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ? Let me tell you what he does not mean by that. He doesn't, he doesn't mean by that that the atoning sacrificial work of Christ, suffering on the cross, was inadequate or insufficient. Paul is certainly not teaching that Christ's atoning sacrifice is not sufficient and we need to make up for it by sacrificial atoning of our own suffering. He's not saying that. We cannot participate in our salvation. All we can do is receive the free gift of salvation purchased by Jesus at the cross. And even in the book of Colossians, it would be contrary to the theme of the very epistle we're reading where he says Christ is sufficient. And that we're complete in Christ. And when Jesus hung on the cross, He cried, it is finished to tell us die, paid in full. So He's not saying that His atonement is not complete and we need to make it up by helping to atone for our own sins. What He's saying is, is that they persecuted Christ, they rejected Christ, the world suffered or persecuted Christ and He suffered, and that we are His followers and being identified with Jesus, following Jesus, means that we will suffer in His place. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, your Lord and Master, they're going to persecute you. Paul said it like this in Philippians 3.10. He said, I want to know Him, that is Jesus Christ. I want to know the power of His resurrection. And then he said, I want to know the fellowship of His sufferings. And I want to be made conformable unto His Death. That's what Paul's talking about. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know the fellowship that comes from suffering for Christ that drives you. Now, when you suffer for Christ, guess what that does? It drives you closer to Christ. And when you're closer to Christ, you're going to be more like Christ. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to suffer because of it. And when you suffer because of it, it drives you to Jesus. And when you drive to Jesus, He changes your life, and then you suffer more. You go, I don't know if I like this, Pastor. I don't know if I want to be like Jesus. 
I'm always praying, Lord, let the way be smooth. Slightly downhill, wind at my back, lined with roses, take the thorns out, and let everyone clap for me as I go by. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. That's how I pray. I don't want the way to be rough. I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to go the way of the cross. I don't want to follow Jesus, a crucified Lord. But Jesus said that will be our lot. They rejected me, they'll reject you. But we know the fellowship of the sufferings. But you know the badge of a true minister is that they're willing to suffer. They're willing to sacrifice. They're willing to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul verse 23-28 to says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I more. I in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, imprisonments more frequent, and in deaths often. He said, I, I, I'm a pastor. Paul, when Paul wanted to prove that he was a minister, he didn't pull out a clergy card. He took his shirt off and showed him the whips, the stripes on his back. He said, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And journeys often in perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of mine own countrymen, perils by heathen, perils in the city, Perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. You think Paul had perils? In weariness, painfulness, watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, and beside all that which is without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Welcome to the ministry. Paul says, I was whipped and beaten and shipwrecked and rejected and cold and hungry. And that's the ministry. That's what it means to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But what a privilege to suffer for Christ and for His church. Let me give you the third mark of a true minister. A true minister is a steward of the mysteries of Christ. Now this is a larger section of our text, verse 25 down to verse 28. But notice at verse 25 it says, "Whereof I am made a minister, and here's the phrase, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul's ministry was a stewardship. You say, well, Pastor John, I don't see the word stewardship in the text. So where do you get that idea? It's found in the word dispensation. I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. The word dispensation literally means house law. And we actually get our word economy or economics from it. It denotes careful stewardship. So it came to mean stewardship. It's one who cares for the interest or property of another. It speaks of a responsibility and a privilege. Do you know that God has given us His Word? God has trusted us with His truth. God has given us the church to broaden and strengthen and encourage. And we are stewards over the ministry. All of us are. In the parable of the talents, He gave a certain number of talents to each person. And then the Master came back to see what they did with them. And someone multiplied them and He said, you're to be commended. But one, one, one servant took the talent, wrapped it in a cloth, and buried it in the ground. You know the story? And he came back to the master. He said, here's that what you gave me. And the master said, why didn't you put it in the bank? This is a free paraphrase. Why didn't you put it in the bank so that I could at least get some interest on it? Uh, of course, today, I don't know if this parable would work or not. <laughs> you have to pay the bank to keep your money. I'll stop right there. I don't want to get on, I don't, I don't want to get on, on a bank tirade. I'm not real happy with banks right now. You're going to charge me to keep my money in your bank? I, 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 I don't get that. I think I'll just put it in the mattress or something. <laughs> but he wasn't using what God, what the Master had given to him is the point of the parable. So God has given you an opportunity. God's given you a voice. God's given you His Word. If you come on Sunday, you're learning the Bible, you're responsible to share that with somebody. I'd be, oh, Pastor John, I'm learning so much from your sermons on Sunday. Well, great. What are you doing? Ah, I'm underlining it in red. 
I got notes in my Bible. See, see, I got notes in my Bible. Well, how does it change your life? Does it make you a better husband, better wife, a better parent, more obedient child? Is it making you more ungodly? Are you faithfully serving the Lord as a result of the knowledge of His Word? That, that's what it's all about. It's not about just having a big head. It's about having a transformed life. Paul's stewardship was to God's Word. I want you to notice in verse 25, to fulfill the Word of of God. I believe that my highest priority as your pastor is to be faithful to this book. Is to be a man of the book. To be a preacher of the book. To teach the Word. To preach the Word. To proclaim God's Word. Nothing more, nothing less. To fulfill the Word of God means that I must be faithful to preach it and I must not compromise what I preach. I must be faithful to preach the Word, nothing more, nothing less. And I must not compromise it by adding to it, taking away from it, or misinterpreting it. Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, Timothy, preach the what? The Word. He told him how to preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. And he said, do it with all long-suffering and patience. And he told them why to preach the Word. Because the time will come when men will not endure what? Sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now the itching ears is not the teacher, it's the listener. It's the people in the pews. Their ears tickle and they want them itched. When the pastor preaches, instead of saying preach it, they say itch it. Itch it, preacher, itch it. Oh, that feels good. And they want a preacher to tell them they're okay, everything's fine, there's no hell, you can live however you want, all paths lead to God. Oh, itch it, Pastor, oh, itch it. They don't want the truth. They judge whether a man is sent from God and true by what it does for them and how they like it and how it makes them feel as to whether it's true. Let me tell you something that's so very important. Whether you're in this church or any church, what you should do when you listen to someone preach the Bible is ask yourself, is that true? Is that what the Bible really says? Is that what that text actually means and says? Is that scriptural? Is that really Bible truth? Or is that just his opinion or his views? And what we want is the Word of God. Amen? We want a thus saith the Lord. We don't want man's opinion. We need to preach the Gospel. Let me give you five facts about Paul's preaching in this passage. First of all, it revealed the mystery, verse 26 and 27. And that mystery was Christ in you, the hope of glory. That God would take Jew and God would take Gentiles and He would blend them together into one body, which is the body of Christ. And by the way, a New Testament mystery he describes here is that which in ages past, verse 26, was hidden from generations, but now is made manifest or revealed to His saints, or to New Testament believers. A mystery is something that cannot be known unless God reveals it, and He has. But it means in the Old Testament it wasn't revealed. And what what they didn't know from the Old Testament was that Christ would live in the hearts of Gentiles. And that Jew and Gentile would be one new humanity. And they would be the body of Christ. Read Ephesians chapter 3 where he so eloquently and powerfully explains the oneness of the body of Christ and that the middle wall of partition had been broken down and that Jew and Gentile are all one in Christ. So there's the revelation in his preaching and there was the proclamation in his preaching. Verse 28, whom we preach, he preached Christ. So his preaching revealed the mystery of the church His preaching was centered in Christ, whom we preach. Christianity is Christ. And then thirdly, there was admonition in his preaching. It contained warning. Verse 28, warning every man. So he would warn unbelievers of the coming judgment and the wrath of God and of hell. And he would also warn believers about false religions and false cults and false group. You know what is not popular today in preaching? Warning people about false teachers. Naming names. Listing cults. 
Whenever that's done, people say, well, that's not right, or you shouldn't get down on people, or you shouldn't you know, criticize someone else. And instead of just what is true and what is false, what is biblical and what isn't biblical, we, we don't have that ability to think critically. Actually, political correctness has come into the church. And we've weakened the preaching of God's Word and watered it down to where it has to be palatable and nice and friendly and happy and good. And the preacher should always smile and say positive things. Never anything negative. The preacher should say what the Bible says. Amen? That's what the preacher should say. If the Bible warns us, then we should be warned. If the Bible admonishes, we should be admonished. If the Bible rebukes us, we should be rebuked. The job of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's the job of the preacher. So there's revelation, there's proclamation, there's admonition. And then notice verse 28. There's instruction. It contained teaching. Teaching every man. That's what Paul did when he preached. That's what I need to do when I preach. That's what you need to do is teach others and share with others. There should be content, didactic, doctrinal content, teaching what is right, belief and behavior and doctrine and duty. And then notice, fifthly, its purpose. I love it. Verse 28, its purpose is that we may present every man, which is person, mankind, perfect, in Christ Jesus. This is transformation. So the elements of Paul's preaching was revelation, proclamation, admonition, instruction, and transformation. I want to present, Paul says, all of you perfect. Now the word perfect means mature. It means full grown. It doesn't mean sinlessly perfect. It was used of fruit that was fully ripened. So my job as your pastor is to ripen you. To bring you to full maturity. Ephesians chapter 4, the minister is for the perfecting of the saints that they might do the work of the ministry. We're all to be stewards of the Gospel of Christ. George Whitfield said, other men may preach the Gospel better than I, but no man can preach a better Gospel. I love that. And some of you may preach it better than I, but they're not going to preach a better message. And then fourthly and lastly, verse 29, the mark of a true minister is that they strive in the power of Christ. They work hard, they labor, they strive, but it's all according to His power and His working in their life. Notice verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. So Paul was determined to be a true minister of Jesus Christ, he uses the phrase in verse 29, whereunto. So this was his purpose. And he had two things that he did. He labored and he strove. And he did all of that in the power of the Spirit of Christ given to him. Now the word labored, verse 29, means physical and mental exhaustion. It means to labor to the point of being weary and exhausted. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Paul said, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What motivated Paul to labor to the point of exhaustion was that he knew that he would be rewarded. That one day he would hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let me tell you, that for myself and for all of us included to serve the Lord, you know what our motivation is? Our motivation is to please God and to honor God and to glorify God. And that one day, we are going to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I believe with all of my heart that there's coming a time for every one of us as Christians that this one thing is the only thing that's going to matter. All the things that you're worried about, all the things you're so absorbed in, all the things you're so distracted with, all the desires and the passions and the pursuits you have all boil down to this. Will you hear Christ say, well done, good and faithful servant? 
when you enter into heaven. That's all that matters. And that's all that matters. And that's all that should motivate us and constantly motivate us. Why does the minister do what he does? Why does he work? Why does he labor? Why does he fly? Why does he teach? Why does he study? Why does he pray? Why does he sacrifice? Many times, even their own families suffer because of their commitment to the church and the work of Christ. Because he wants to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And the word strove, he goes from laboring to striving. The word strive is even more intense. It's the Greek word agonizo. We get our word agonize from it. It was used of athletes who would agonize in running a race or in wrestling. I remember I used to wrestle when I was young. We used to wrestle. It was so taxing, so demanding. And then my, uh, we had our son, Jared, and Jared and I, you know, kind of the dad, dad-son thing to do, we wrestle and get on the floor and wrestle and, you know, and then he'd start getting bigger and stronger. It's like, uh, come on, dad, let's wrestle. No, 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 no. <laughs> I remember I got him boxing gloves when he was about five, and I'd kneel in the living room and we'd box, and every year, boy, he'd hit me a few times, you know, it's just like... Whoa, 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 whoa. So I'm getting older and weaker. He's getting older and stronger. And then one time he decked me. He was about 11. And I was like, okay. I took off those gloves and threw them down. <laughs> no more boxing. No more boxing anymore, you know. This is like humiliating. It's strenuous. And that's what Paul uses to describe the ministry. Ministry is hard work. The evangelist D.L. Moody was said to have come home so tired from his preaching that one time he fell in bed and said, Lord, I'm tired. Good night. Boom. And he just hit the snow. I've prayed that same prayer many times. Lord, I'm tired. Good night. And he hit the hay. So he says, yeah, I was striving and I was working, but here's the closing point verse 29. According to... His working. That word working, we get our word energy from it. According to His energy, which energizes me mightily. I love that. You know God has promised to give you strength for whatever He calls you to do? I'm convinced that's true of me. Whatever God's called me to do, He gives me the strength to do it. When I don't have the strength to do what, he's, what I'm doing, then obviously God's not called me to do that. God, it's your work. God, it's your ministry. This is your church. These are your people. Lord, you'll have to give me the strength and the ability to do what you've called me to do. And if it's not there, then maybe he's called me to do something else. You know, God's given you the strength to be the wife he's called you to be, the husband he's called you to be, the servant he's called you to be. Whatever God calls us to do, he gives us his grace and strength. Paul said, but the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. I, I hope and pray that as the result of the study of this passage this morning, that you not only know what the minister is to be and to do, but you also know that you're called to be ready to share the gospel of Christ, to be willing to suffer for the cause of Christ, to be faithful as stewards of Christ, and to strive in the energy and in the power of Christ. Amen? Let's pray.